Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is about this little thing called autophagy. The 2016 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded to a cell biologist named Yoshinori Osumi for his discoveries of mechanisms of autophagy. That was awarded uh, a couple of years after uh, the Bulletproof Diet came out, where one of the techniques, which I called Bulletproof Protein Fasting, uh, where you avoid almost all protein for 24 hours to turn on this amazing process in the body uh, when I, I published the book. But the Nobel Prize was based usually on 30 or 40 years of research. So this is stuff we've known about, but you probably haven't heard about. And the reason that there was a, a rush of interest in this is because autophagy means self-eating. And it's described as the cellular house cleaning or self-renewal process and there's something in your cells you probably don't know about called autophagosomes. And they're built around junk the body wants to destroy. So these things compost the garbage into reusable building blocks and nutrients. And what are some things like that? Uh, fat deposits, older damaged organelles, clumps of poisonous proteins, toxic molecules. Basically, if something's going to gum up your works, you might want to clean it out every now and then. And you're going to read a lot more about this in my anti-aging book that's coming up here. Right now, there are more than a dozen biotech firms developing small molecule drugs to enhance or inhibit autophagy to treat all kinds of diseases. And I would put aging on that list of diseases. Today's guest is a very interesting author, public speaker, and coach who's really focused in on autophagy. His name is Seem Land and uh, he's in Estonia. And his newest book is about 500 pages. It's called Metabolic Autophagy. Uh, it's one of those books you can't put down if you're into the metabolism. And if you're not into the metabolism, it might be a bit much, but that's all right, because we all have a metabolism. The question is, how much do you want to know? In today's episode, you're going to learn quite a bit about what's going on in there that you didn't know about and what you can do about it. Seem, welcome to the show. Hey, Hey, Dave. Thanks for having me. Now, you've been on a couple of my friends' shows as well. Uh, you've been on uh, Dr. Mercola's show. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's pretty cool. He's, uh, uh, he's a friend and has been at the conference. He mentioned your name and uh, several other of my, uh, my colleagues are like, Dave, you got to talk to Seam. So I've been <laughs> excited to do this. You started your blog about this just in 2015, and you were still in college, and you weren't studying autophagy. You were studying something almost the same, mm. anthropology. I mean, they, they rhyme sort of, but yeah. <laughs> what what's going on with that? Why are you an autophagy uh, fanboy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I think, uh, like I said, like if you're interested in this metabolism and everything related to the body, then it kind of creates this intrinsic curiosity about uh, how do you how, or how how does these things work as well as how do you optimize them and uh, like i've been into this biohacking thing for yeah ever since i you know, started college and uh, at that time i was focused on anthropology but it wasn't something that uh, i would like wanted to do for the rest of my life it was like somewhat i, I was like sh just scratching my own inch <laughs> and uh, wanted to uh, learn more about the human like the human animal or the human uh, being inside a culture and inside a society so in a way it it isn't directly connected with uh, like biochemistry or biology or autophagy but it's still something that kind of teaches you or makes you more curious about the human animal and uh, how does everything work and during that time i was you know creating articles on my blog and uh, one of the kind of re-emerging topics that i was really fascinated about was intermittent fasting and autophagy so <laughs> ever since that time i was just you know, scavenging all the different new research that has come out of it and uh, learning how do you actually apply it to like your everyday uh, life. And uh, now that I've written a book about it, I just wanted to share all that knowledge that I've gathered over the time and also like refute some of the misconceptions and uh, fallacies about both fasting as well as like general uh, diet. You don't have a degree in medicine or anything like that, right? No, I'm just a uh, bachelor's in anthropology. <laughs> so I got to ask, 
what makes you qualified to write a book like this? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a common question. Like, first of all, I don't, I don't have like a real biochemistry degree, and second, I'm like so young. <laughs> like, who are you talking about uh, longevity and anti aging? But I think um, there, th that's that may be like another one of those strengths that makes people want to learn or pay more attention to me, just because you know it's somewhat so deviant and so contradicting at deviant, the same time. I love it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or it's so rare. It's kind of a dumb question, and I've never really asked that before, because if someone did something, by virtue of doing it, they are now qualified to do it. That, <laughs> that's the definition of it. And uh, uh, a Wall Street Journal uh, reporter asked me that on stage. Like, how dare you do biohacking? You don't have a white lab coat and a, and a medical degree. I'm like, well, here's here's one of the little things. You can't take away my medical license for telling the truth now, can you? And I've yeah. <laughs> interviewed lots of doctors on the show who had their license revoked when they said, hey, I found something new. And then you know, they get slapped around for a while, and 20 years later, someone comes along and says, oh, actually, this does work. But by then, they've ruined their career. So there's a role for people with inquisitive minds like you to go out there, dig deep. You have 50 pages of references uh, in, your, uh, in your book. My very first one, the Better Baby book, like, what right do I have to write that? I don't know. There was 1,100 references in the book, and it was yeah. actually researched. So yeah, doing yeah. research, you don't have to have a, a degree, much less a degree in medicine or biology. So... It just the curiosity and willingness to do awesome things. Yeah, that, that's that's the that's the beauty of like biohackers taking yeah. taking control of their own uh, health and actually yeah. going deeper into the science than other people. <laughs> you nailed it, and you're definitely. I mean, you're all over um, this idea of biohacking, and I love it that you started when you were at the uh, basically when you started school. So you started school what in 2011. Uh, yeah, something like that, yeah. Oh, that, so that was right I when, think, like, the term was just when I first wrote the definition of it, and you're, uh, <laughs> so you were very early. That's cool. Yeah. And yeah. right now, your Body, Mind, Empowerment podcast, you got 120 episodes, uh, you're interviewing a lot of people to learn. Which is a higher ROI, return on investment for you? Uh, reading a paper on PubMed about something, or interviewing someone about something? Mm, I think it depends on the particular topic, like, uh, there's definitely a lot to learn from many individuals and uh, like this just uh, osmosis effect uh, learning from the like near exposure from them. Like if you talk to people like Mercola or uh, I don't know, uh, you know, Vishen Lakhiani, then you can definitely gain more than just the knowledge from them. You gain more like this sort of a general vibe and you kind of learn how, how you learn the way they think and that kind of changes your own way of thinking. So I think that is much more powerful than just you know reading uh, regular studies, etc. Especially if you don't have, let's say, a lot of uh, background, or you don't have like a, like a background knowledge about the particular topics, you may just you know reading it for nothing, and you may not get that much out of it. Whereas if, whereas a real conversation is definitely more, you know, it's gonna rub off on you <laughs> a lot more. I I love that answer. Uh, yeah, the the idea of getting a vibe from someone, I learn more from having a really good conversation with someone smart. Uh, someone who's done the research, usually then by going out and doing the research myself, although sometimes I'm like, ah, oh, there was a nugget and I had to read that paper and whatever. But uh, you can read an awful lot in a, in a cave somewhere and maybe not move along your path as far as just uh, being able to interview, you know, 100 people who are doing yeah. good stuff, So which is which yeah. is cool. One of the reasons I continue to do the show, I don't... Uh, I don't have to continue doing Bulletproof Radio. I just like to because, you know, yeah. we get to have this conversation. All right, let's jump into metabolic autophagy. Why did you choose that title for your book? Mm -hmm. Metabolic versus mm -hmm. the benefits of super autophagy, you know, <laughs> what what was behind your, your thought process there? Because I wouldn't have known how to name a book this complex. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, when you look at what does metabolic mean, then it just refers to the general uh, kind of processes and the phenomenon of your metabolism. And that's generally everything that is related to energy production, uh, you know, growth, repair, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So your entire world is almost surrounded by the concept of uh, metabolism. And uh, the reason I added autophagy to that is also that when, when I was doing that research about autophagy, then I realized that it's kind of a very central component uh, to everything else that your body goes through on a daily basis. And there's some form of autophagy happening almost all the time. And it's very connected 
to, for instance, like life extension from caloric restriction. It's connected to uh, brain uh, protection against neurodegeneration and uh, general insulin sensitivity. It protects against mu muscle sarcopenia and so on. So yeah, I found it to be actually so much more important and so much more central to uh, the entire metabolic processes. So uh, it was a good combination I decided to kind of put together. I, I understand controlling our metabolism is, uh, is is really important, and it feels like autophagy goes beyond just your metabolism. Your metabolism is you know the rate at which you're turning food and air into electrons at the end of the day, and uh, some of the stuff that's going on here is more about system self repair and mm -hmm. other uh, longevity and anti aging things like that, which is uh, why I'm, I've been fascinated with autophagy uh, for uh, for a very long time. Uh, so if autophagy goes beyond the metabolism, uh, let's just jump into some of the stuff that works from your book. What is your take on why intermittent fasting has a place? Uh, yeah, for, well, I think um, intermittent fasting is almost like a very a normal way of uh, eating that humans evolved under. Like if you think that <laughs> hunter-gatherers in the past were used to eating three squares a meal a day, then you're quite wrong. And uh, they were actually more, they spent more time in a fasted state than in a fed one. So that already tells you that uh, the process of a t or doing some form of intermittent fasting or time restricted eating itself is almost uh, built into the natural ways our metabolism is supposed to work. And uh, also research is showing that uh, well, at least one of the few known ways of promoting lifespan in uh, across all species is caloric restriction. Uh, that applies to like yeast, flies, uh, roundworms, etc. But mm -hmm. uh, when you actually look deeper into that, then you can see that autophagy plays a critical role in the life extension effects of caloric restriction, uh, such as if you uh, genetically modify uh, some mice that they won't express autophagy in adequate amounts, even when they are put under severe caloric restriction, then those mice, they're not going to live longer. Uh, whereas the mice that have normal autophagy activated during caloric restriction, those mice, they, you know, show those life extension benefits. So the kind of, and that, that applies to like different research in yeast as well as mice. So that can tell you that the goal or the, the reasons why caloric restriction extends lifespan isn't just because of the caloric restriction, it's because it stimulates certain longevity pathways, uh, such as autophagy, such as sirtuins, such as foxoproteins, AMPK, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, those things, they, they can be activated with other means besides just caloric restriction. And uh, intermittent fasting has been shown to be as effective, if not even more effective, in uh, inducing those same benefits. And uh, you, don't, you don't have to starve, basically. <laughs> uh, I, I've been to more than a few conferences uh, at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine and places like that, uh, just from 20 years of... Uh, of anti-aging nonprofit work. And there's always five or six people who are rail thin and they're saying, well, you know, I, I'm practicing caloric restriction and I eat 1300 calories a day and I, I really don't feel like I'm hungry all the time. And, and I got used to being cold all the time and they do not look well. They're saying, but I'm, hmm. I'm going to live longer. And I'm just thinking that's not the kind of life. If, if you live one third less, <laughs> uh, one third yeah. less quality and you live one third longer, you sort of maybe washed out. Yeah. Um, and so I, I never looked at that as a sustainable, attractive thing that anyone other than extreme radicals would do. And yeah, yeah it looks like intermittent fasting probably is going to get us most of the way there, if not all the way. Yeah, well, um, I, want, I want to also add that uh, although someone may be eating like 1,200 calories a day just to uh, practice caloric restriction and they hope to live longer, it doesn't mean that they actually gain those benefits because you have to also take into account uh, metabolic adaptation. So they say yeah. that you have to to gain the benefits of caloric restriction you have to reduce your calories for like 10 to 20 percent and uh, make sure you don't experience malnutrition but the problem is that if you're eating 10 20 percent fewer calories over the course of months and years then your body gets used to it and you have to drastically reduce <laughs> those calories again so you're going to end up have to consume like 40 percent fewer calories than you normally would and and etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's it's not very you end sustainable up becoming a breatharian at a certain yeah. point you have you know, one yeah, leaf yeah, so every day <laughs> uh, this idea of cycles where some days you eat a normal amount of calories and and some days you don't it it just works even the whole keto perspective uh, it's always been hey Ketosis for a while, come out of ketosis, go back in. Yeah. 
uh, versus just staying in it forever. And we're going to get yeah. into that in a bit. But first up, uh, you do a really good job of talking about catabolism versus uh, an, well, anabolism. I hate that word. Uh, ana versus <laughs> an anabolic state. Can you talk about the difference between the two states and what intermittent fasting does? Yeah, for sure. Well, if you look at the the way your body works, then your body is always kind of trying to monitor the nutritional environment that it is in. And uh, for that, it has developed these different fuel sensors that detect the energy status and the nutrient status of your body at, the, at, at any particular moment. And those two nutrient sensors are mTOR, which is mechanistic target of rapamycin, and AMPK. And they are almost like the two sides, the two, two, the yin and yang of your metabolism that are constantly balancing each other out. So mTOR is the main growth pathway that stimulates cell growth, repair, and uh, anabolism. And AMPK is the catabolic side, which is more like breakdown and recycling that kind of forces ketosis that also promotes autophagy and uh, enables the body to clear itself out. So those two things are constantly being balanced on the 24 hour period. And when you're fasting, then you're more catabolic. You're breaking things down, you're uh, activating AMPK, you're suppressing mTOR. And when you're eating, then you're doing the opposite. You're, you know, inhibiting uh, AMPK, you're becoming more anabolic and you're activating mTOR just so you, you can uh, repair. So that's why intermittent fasting refers to cycling in and out of uh, different sides of the coin. So to say going catabolic to gain the benefits of the self-repair and uh, every once in a while to go into the anabolic side so you can actually, you know, build tissue and uh, not uh, waste away. The way you explain that, 24-hour cycles, so there's times when you have a lot of one, a lot of the other. It seems like when I really peel back the label on a lot of the biohacking techniques uh, that I uh, that I recommend, whether it's the nutritional supplement uh, or even a lot of the machinery uh, from Upgrade Labs, uh, there's a way to do some like cryotherapy where, oh, yeah. I'm getting, you know, I guess in uh, Celsius, 160 degrees below zero, but it's only for three minutes. But the idea is mm. that is a really deep valley of temperature, way beyond what yeah. your body would normally expect, which causes a strong adaptation response. And then the same thing for uh, like... Uh, we call it the cheat machine, but it, it lets you exercise against a, a, something that's not gravity, and it puts on muscle about three times faster than normal things, just by changing the slope of the curve. So if if you believe that idea that the body will adapt based on the height of the peak or the base of the trough, it would follow that two of the techniques uh, for changing mTOR and MK uh, pharmaceutically might be a good idea. So mm -hmm. for AMPK, what people recommend is one of two things, metformin or betaine, uh, essentially herbs. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other side, you can take rapamycin. Do you use either one of those? Uh, I don't use uh, either metformin or rapamycin, uh, although like I have seen like very promising research about it, and I do think that it can definitely work uh, in, in inducing autophagy and suppressing mTOR. And uh, like it, it can be somewhat of a good strategy for uh, someone who is interested in dipping into autophagy more frequently, etc. And also like some of the negative side effects related to metformin, they, I think they are somewhat over-exaggerated for someone who is healthy, someone taking metformin, you know, infrequently, etc. Then I don't see like a huge issue there. And I think that would be, I, I would just maybe like try to wait for more um, like human trials before I, I myself start tricking it. But I do think they take other si similar uh, uh, compounds like uh, berberine, for instance. Berberine is essentially like a very similar kind of a drug or a natural uh -huh. supplement that uh, that also mimics the same similar effects as metformin and uh, like lower I said betaine and I meant berberine uh, earlier. So uh, thank you for, uh, for that correction there. Um, I started taking metformin somewhere around 2007, 2008, when the first studies came out. And this mm -hmm. company called Biomarker Pharmaceuticals uh, went and did all these uh, studies on mice, the life extension studies of metformin, and said, hey, this old diabetes drug, if you take it in a different dosing thing, it has effects. So I took it for about three years. I ended up meeting the founding team at Biomarker. 
Uh, and they couldn't believe I'd been doing it. And I said, yeah, of course I started doing it after the first, you know, the, the first paper came out. Why wouldn't I? Because I, I've basically been suffering from the diseases of aging when I was young and I don't like this. Mm -hmm. And I quit though, uh, because some other studies came out that showed uh, that it could have mitochondrial suppression. And mm -hmm. I'm right on the fence of going back onto it because for the last eight years I've taken uh, berberine, uh, just mm -hmm. like you, you talked about. But a recent interview with James Clements, uh, we talked about the fact that there are some studies that show that that herb uh, can cause uh, cardiac issues, including low heart rate and low blood pressure, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, including some life-threatening things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea that you might have a sudden drop in your blood pressure because you're taking this herb, I mean, sudden as in you pass out sort of thing, Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe it's worth looking into that. So I, I'm debating. Would it be wise to to do low dose uh, metformin on an occasional base just to increase my cellular cleanup? And I know you're not a doctor, and you you can't make mm -hmm. recommendations and stuff like yeah. that. But if you were talking to someone who is you know late forties, metabolically healthy, wanted to live for a very long time, what would you, given all the research you've read, what would you think about? Yeah, that's a really like good point, so to say that the, these drugs they work um, because they lower your blood blood uh, sugar and uh, they drop insulin a lot. So uh, the reason you want to actually you know cycle between those states is like a important thing because you know if you combine all these different biohacks like intermittent fasting, taking metformin doing high intensity exercise, eating keto, et cetera, then it becomes like a, the hormetic stimulus, so to say, becomes somewhat overbearing for your body to yeah. uh, kind of endure. And that's why it's, uh, you know, everything is the poison is in the dose. So uh, I think like doing it cyclically is the key, so to say, you don't want to be activating the, uh, you don't want to activate autophagy all the time. You don't want to be taking berberine all the time. You don't want to be in keto all the time. And at the same time, you don't want to be anabolic and you don't want to be, you know, activating mTOR all the time. So the key is like uh, cyclical and variation. And uh, I, I myself, I usually when I take berberine, then I combine it after like some some form of like a higher carb meal, just so I can like uh, lower my blood sugar faster and I can go back into autophagy and ketosis faster as well. So yeah, I'm not taking it like on a consistent basis. Okay. But if I would take them, then I would combine it like strategically around those times where I would know that either my blood sugar is going to be slightly higher or like my insulin is higher. Why don't you just use vanadyl sulfate and chromium after those meals? Doesn't that work better anyway? Um, yeah, you can take them as well. Uh, but, you know, depends on uh, what kind of a, you know, I think there, there's not going to be a much huge difference. Depends on like how much, uh, let's say in the example of cyclical keto, depends on how many carbs you're eating or how high your blood sugar actually goes, etc. Do you worry about low insulin? I would worry about it if I would start to see like some negative side, side effects in my metabolism or my thyroid functioning or uh, like m muscle development, so to say. Um, ins insulin, like lower insulin levels are being shown to be like associated with greater longevity in other species. But again, I think it's a matter of uh, cyclical, cyclical aspects that you don't want to be probably yeah. suppressing it all the time because insulin has many beneficial effects. Like a lot of the low carb keto people, they tend to villainize insulin, but insulin yeah, is one of the, one of the most, <laughs> one of the most anabolic hormones and it's, it's very useful, but only if you activate it at the right time and you do it strategically. It's funny that there's a thing called IGF-1, insulin-like mm -hmm. growth factor. It's insulin-like because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it does what <laughs> insulin does, which makes you, you grow. Yeah. Um, in the research uh, for Superhuman, my uh, anti-aging book uh, that just hit Amazon, I talk about risk of all-cause mortality in humans from studies uh, from high insulin versus low insulin. Chronic low insulin is more dangerous than mm. high insulin. However, I wouldn't want high insulin either. What yeah. you want is a well-regulated metabolism. And of course, just like you've said already twice in the show, maybe you should be in ketosis some of the time, but probably not continuously forever, which is yeah. one of the big keto myths. It just drives me nuts. And that's mm. why you know, the, the original recommendations uh, that I've come out with and evolved over the time, it, it, it's cyclical, cyclical, cyclical. And you're coming out with uh, a lot of new research supporting that from this angle on autophagy. Yeah. And the same applies to uh, some of the negative side effects of autophagy as well. Like 
chronic autophagy can actually promote tumor metastasis, so to say, that uh, the, if, you, if, you're, if you are like some of the research is saying that autophagy is amazing for disease prevention and for making sure that you don't get disease. But if you're already sick, then it's essentially potentially strengthening some of the malignancy just because it's like a self-repair uh, process and it doesn't have like objective understanding of what's good or bad. It's just uh, some of the cancer cells may just feed off of it and steal some of the, the, um, the residue that's created by autophagy. So yeah, that's why the cyclical approach is definitely even for autophagy and fasting uh, much more important. You're, I'm guessing, around a little under 30? Uh, 24. 24. All right. So more than a little under 30. <laughs> and you have talked about how you do 20 hour intermittent fasting and you've been doing it for seven years. Mm -hmm. Do you do it every day? Uh, not every day. Like I probably have uh, once a week where I'm uh, not fasting, so to say, that long. I'll probably have like two to three meals uh, on that particular day just to kind of break the cycle. Um, I've known a, a good number of young, healthy, especially men, who are, are just saying, wow, I feel way better. My body works better. I have abs. Intermittent fasting is, is something I'm going to do every day for the rest of my life. I love this. But I also do a lot of work with people at all age ranges, especially because I do anti-aging stuff. I, I've got mm -hmm. people in their 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, as well as you see a bunch of CEOs um, who typically aren't in the best shape, although that's changing these days. Most of them, if they're not already on a pretty advanced regimen, if they start intermittent fasting every day, especially doing it for 20 hours like you do, what happens? I think that uh, for uh, older people, it's just very more, they have to be more careful with uh, what kind of foods they're eating and uh, making sure that they get more nutrients during the feeding window. Because uh, as you get older, you naturally experience this decline in growth hormone testosterone as well as uh, anabolic resistance so it becomes very difficult it becomes like more difficult for you to maintain lean muscle tissue and uh, maintaining lean tissue is like incredibly important for longevity and anti-aging so generally the way i can see that it can be bypassed is to just uh, increase the protein content of your diet a little bit as well as the nutrient density and uh, also shortening the fasting window so to say so as you as you as you're older or as you're like under some extreme nutritional stress, uh, whether that be from like uh, high high level exercise or uh, being pregnant or being underage, etc., then for them they can just adjust their fasting regimen by shortening their fasting window, and they can still gain the same benefits because they they don't need to be fasting that long uh, to for their body to go into this sort of a self repair mode. Uh, that's uh, that's a really good uh, nuanced answer uh, that matches my experience. It feels like there's, uh, it, essentially it's a stress on the body to do intermittent fasting, right? And if you're not in great shape, <laughs> you might want to start intermittent fasting three times a week, right? Uh, you, you, know, you, you might want to say, well, today I didn't sleep well last night. I feel like crap uh, and I'm going to be flying to New York. So you know, in fact, if you're flying, I still think you should fast, um, or at least have some <laughs> some uh, brain octane before you go to get some ketones there. But mm. um, I, I just I, I question whether that advice that works really well when you're under 30 uh, and you know exercising a lot and and you know managing life differently than when you're 50 and you know chronically sleep deprived and stressed mm. and doing okay. things. Uh, so I I would just caution listeners. Uh, yes, intermittent fasting is a powerful technique. It works differently for men and women, uh, and it's okay to start slow and it's okay to be cyclical, uh, mm -hmm. but you will end up probably uh, the way I am where um, if I have a, an intense day, um, I, I actually uh, will do uh, bulletproof coffee where I do get some ketones in the morning when my insulin stays perfectly flat. Uh, I know you mentioned uh, bulletproof coffee somewhere in the book. Um, you say it's uh, at least part at least part science and part hype, if I remember right. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I'll do that. And if it's a day where I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to be sitting around doing a podcast or something like this morning, all I did uh, was I had a, uh, uh, a bunch of strange herbs and supplements and a, a big cup of black bulletproof coffee. As in, mm. I use the, the mold-free beans. But uh, I would say for the average executive or the average person with an intense life, 
if they're starting intermittent fasting, how are they going to feel at 1130 in, yeah. in the afternoon or in the morning? You know, when the first time they skip breakfast, what usually happens? Yeah, for sure. Like if you haven't done any form of fasting before, then and you're coming from like a sugar burning metabolism, then it's going to be really difficult yeah. to get to it because your body isn't used to using ketones. And I think, yeah, definitely the, the Bulletproof Coffee is an amazing thing for teaching the body to become more fat adapted yeah. and start using ketones, yeah. etc. So uh, although like, um, well, the, uh, the the fats you get from Bulletproof Coffee, they actually promote some form of autophagy, which is like a subcategory of autophagy called chaperone-mediated autophagy. So uh, that, that's that type of autophagy is uh, stimulated by ketone bodies, and it's more of like a specific type that just uh, targets specific proteins, mainly like branched-chain amino acids. So you can definitely maintain this this state of autophagy, even if you drink uh, bulletproof coffee, so to say. And uh, if you like combine it with some form of uh, time restricted eating, then you're getting like increased basal autophagy even. So yeah, it's a very effective strategy for uh, building fat adaptation and uh, even uh, gaining the benefits of autophagy. You know, I didn't have any idea that you were gonna say that, uh, but I'm, I'm grateful you did. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> I've been saying for years, look, I do not have uh, a double-blinded clinical study that shows you when you put some brain octane in your coffee or butter or you know the whole bulletproof coffee recipe um, that that it will do the same autophagy. But all the observations I've had are that when when me or others when we drink bulletproof coffee only in the morning without even adding the bulletproof collagen stuff to it because that would be protein it changes the effects. That that there's definitely a form of autophagy happening, and it may or may not be the same as if you just had uh, coffee, tea, water, or mm. zero calories. Uh, and you're saying that at least the chaperone mediated side's there. Well, what's missing if if you if you don't have brain octane or everything that enhances ketones? Um, what's the other kind of autophagy besides chaperone mediated? Uh, well, the main form of autophagy is uh, macroautophagy. And the other form of like a sub form of is also like microautophagy. So I'm not sure like how big the difference is between like chaperone-mediated autophagy and macroautophagy. But I would say that macroautophagy would just uh, the effects or the like the metabolic effects would be somewhat greater because uh, you're not act, you're uh, keeping the mTOR much lower than you were to be when you you're taking like some form of uh, fats. So to say, because although fats they don't suppress or they don't raise insulin, they can still change the energy status of your cells, so to say, by changing the ratios between AMPK and mTOR. So uh, yeah, I think the only difference is uh, that with the chaperone mediated autophagy, uh, you you will maintain more deeper ketosis and an increased level of ketosis, uh, but you may not be let's say getting the sort of a uh, more thorough cellular clearance there isn't like any research <laughs> like i said there aren't no, yeah, there, there, we're, there's we're no just both of us are hypothesizing yeah. here but <laughs> but when you read the research enough times you see how it works and you know how it how it should be right yeah yeah <laughs> okay that was a really complete and impressive answer and and while you're answering that you you probably 50 percent of the time you looked up and to the right and your eyes twitch mm -hmm. do you know you do that yeah i don't know this idea i know <laughs> you've, you've noticed it before yeah do you have a weird brain? Uh, <laughs> not sure. Not sure what it means, but uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I'm asking because a, a surprising number of people I've interviewed, and, and this is like more than 600 now. Uh, I, I remember one person uh, must be, I think it was T.S. Wiley on hormones. She says, oh yeah, in college, I, I had a tumor in one part of my brain. And when it grew back, I had that part of my brain twice as big. And now I can read research papers in, in a way that I couldn't before. And she sort of had a superpower. Uh, and so, I mean, did you whack your head? Did you have encephalitis, anything like that? Because you have a really, <laughs> your ability to pull information together, your many standard deviations above the norm, especially for someone who's 24. Right. So, and one thing you're doing is you look up into the right, which, and there's some neurological stuff that's beneficial. I, I tend to look up into the left, by the way, mm -hmm. when I'm when I'm pulling information together. But I just want, I'm, I'm curious because you actually do personal development and you're, you talk about energy work and the other stuff. Yeah. Uh, what's your awareness of what you're doing in there? And can you make that teachable or share it with our listeners? I think uh, I just, it's the way I process information. So I'm more of like an audio, audio, audio learner. So I'm not, when, okay. I, when, I'm, when I'm like looking into that corner, then I'm not like actually cognitively 
visualizing or looking at what I see in the corner. I'm actually looking inside my brain <laughs> or trying to extract some of the information from there. So it's I, I suggest it's just my way of uh, processing uh, audio information. And my my favorite way of uh, like learning is also like audio and uh, listening to podcasts and audiobooks. So maybe it's just it has become like a habit. <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's it's benefiting you probably in ways uh, that aren't immediately apparent. There are uh, this actually goes back in the seventies, eighties. There's there's charts that show which quadrant of your uh, of your vision your eyes are going to. You're accessing different parts of the brain. Mm-hmm. So my interpretation of what I'm seeing here is that you're going to a certain part of the brain and giving it more energy when you do that. Mm-hmm. And I'm just wondering if that's a technique that you you picked up through all of your uh, interesting research or whether it's just a natural skill. And it sounds like it's just a natural skill, but you definitely have the ability to pull together very disparate concepts very quickly to form a cohesive answer. And the world needs more of that. <laughs> all right, let's go back to metabolic. What's the one I'm looking for? Uh, metabolic flexibility. Hmm. Uh, what what is your definition of metabolic flexibility and how can people turn it on as quickly as possible? Yeah, well, metabolic flexibility is just your body's ability to swap between different fuel sources and uh, also being able to function well uh, without any fuel, so to say. And uh, that refers to generally like an increased level of uh, fat adaptation and being able to use both fatty acids as well as glucose uh, in different situ- situations. So uh, by default, the body is almost like when you're born, then uh, you're actually born in ketosis, like uh, mother's breast milk is has ketones in it. And the children are general, mm-hmm. the way the g- children survive is by going into ketosis. And that's why they have like some, some higher body fat as well. And uh, when your kids brains have to have ketosis, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. like baby brains, it's vital, right? Yeah. And uh, when you are like getting older, then you ju- just, you know, because you're eating the standard diet, so to say, you're kind of losing it. Uh, you're losing some form of the keto adaptation uh, because of consuming too many carbohydrates and uh, eating too frequently and not practicing like time or eating. So that's a that's kind of a shame. And the problem is that, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong inherently uh, with uh, being just a sugar burner. It's just that it may jeopardize your longevity and it's not going to be that sustainable. So if you are running on sugar, uh, then you're like somewhat metabolically inflexible because you lack the ability to tap into your own body fat stores uh, when you are depleted from, uh, let's say, the last cereal bowl that you ate for breakfast. And uh, mm-hmm. like in a healthy metabolism, a healthy metabolism should be able to go immediately into your own body fat stores whenever you run out of the food that you ate recently because it's part of like the way the human body is evolved under and it should be like healthy and uh, okay. the, the, that's like metabolic flexibility in a sense if you run out of if you run out of glycogen and glucose then you're going to immediately go into ketosis or not immediately but like very fast and you'll be still able to use ketones and your own body fat for fuel and especially during times of fasting and uh, like low carb diets and the way you uh, promote that is through like both ketogenic dieting as well as intermittent fasting so to say and uh, definitely like Im- implementing the cyclical aspect so to say because uh, a ketogenic diet is also somewhat metabolically inflexible because if you stay in ketosis all the time then eventually you're losing your body's ability to process glucose efficiently as well so to say you become somewhat physiologically insulin resistant and that's like a beneficial adaptation in the state of ketosis but it's not optimal for metabolic flexibility so to say and that's why going in and out of it teaches your body to swap those fuel sources more efficiently and uh, in so doing like achieve more uh, freedom and also like flexibility it it's made a really big difference for me because you know when i was 24 uh, that was uh, I guess I had probably lost 20 of my 300 pounds. You know, I, I was probably around 280 at your age, and I uh, I would have, let's see, it was my fourth year of university. Yes, so I'd have been like 21 when mm. I, 22 maybe when I hit 300 yes. pounds. Um, so I, I mean, I was I was in a very different place, uh, struggling with this, and that knowledge just wasn't out there. Um, where I've ended up is, uh, I pretty much have background ketones all the time, mm. and. I don't eat a zero carb or near zero carb diet many days of the week. Some days I do, some days I fast. Like like you, mixing it up is really important. Uh, but when I do eat, 
uh, I put brain octane on my food and I can reliably get a 0.3 to 0.5 uh, millimoles of uh, ketones on a blood stick. So what I'm doing is I'm having more than mother nature would normally put in their ketones and there's some carbs, mm -hmm. but not too many carbs. And since the cells can pull from both of those, metabolic flexibility happens and you throw in the intermittent fasting, you throw in the 24, 48 hour fasting uh, and you know, various exercise and whatever else, uh, it, it feels like my energy levels are higher than they've ever been, probably because they're both there, but it doesn't necessarily require you know, two weeks of extreme bacon only keto sort of thing. Yeah. What's your take on these you know, background ketones, the you know, 0.3 to 0.5 for longer extended periods of time? I think it's uh, very uh, useful in a sense. So um, you get the uh, neurological benefits of ketones as well as the autophagy benefits of ketones, while at the same time, you're not you know, relying on uh, carbohydrates as a main fuel source, and uh, you're not being in a state of hyperinsulinemia so yeah, definitely like combining them together in some shape or form, at least uh, every once in a while, will probably enable you to uh, still maintain keto adaptation uh, without completely kicking yourself out of ketosis and without uh, you know, like uh, damaging your metabolic health in so doing. Because like there's a difference between uh, just being in very strict ketosis and being keto adapted. So being in ketosis would mean like that you have like higher levels of ketones and uh, like the deeper stages of ketosis, they usually start around like 2.0 millimoles and, and up to five, etc. So that will be like a state of nutritional ketosis. But it doesn't really mean that you're like very keto adapted. You can have like a lot of ketones, but you're not able to use them. Uh, but on the other hand, being keto adapted means that your body actually uses them for energy. And uh, that can actually be registered with like a sm slightly smaller amount of ketones as well. Uh, as long as you have enough energy throughout the day, in, entire day and you don't feel like you're like deprived of energy and you need to have like another bagel so to say so if you're keto adapted <laughs> then you then you're able to function much more efficiently without higher levels of ketones because your 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 uh, body is burning them for energy instead of like just storing them in the bloodstream i've often uh, talked with uh, especially the i'm going to call them the keto bros <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the the we call it the radical fringe of uh, keto dieters who have a lot in common with uh, uh, the radical vegans, uh, where it's like if you ever eat a gram of glucose or carbohydrate again, you're a bad man. Yeah. And you're like guys, yeah. <laughs> I've been there, and it gave me leaky gut and food allergies, <laughs> and my sleep went to hell, and my testosterone went down. And you're probably not going to like. In fact, it'll probably make you angry all the time. Oh wait, are are you angry right now? Oh, you are. And, like you, you sort of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pulling the good uh, at the I mean, you've 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 seen these guys online, you know. Just uh, mm. it's, it's it's probably a lack of uh, glucose for the glial cells in the brain to mm -hmm. perform synaptic pruning. Um, so I, man, I, I'm going somewhere with this question, but I just woke up and something's not kicking in my brain. I had this cool thing vegan in my 20s. This kind of thing where I'd lose my train of thought would happen to me 40 times a day. It was just a standard thing and it drove me insane. And I just learned to sort of fake it. And I'm to the point now where it essentially rarely, if ever happens. And it's happened to me twice this morning. So I'm, I'm really scratching my head. I'm like, all right, um, I know my sleep, my sleep quality was weird last night. And I had a half a glass of 2013 French wine mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't feel normal after it. And I'm wondering like, like something's not right metabolically in my brain because I, I just would never lose that. Mm -hmm. So now I'm thinking, all right, what is the thing I did that caused me to have slightly less cognitive function? Do you do stuff like that as well? Like, do you, do you track, hey, my brain isn't working as well today? Mm. Uh, yeah, like definitely you, you know that there are definitely different uh, feedback loops you can pay attention to, even just like the Aura Ring score uh, or your HRV and uh, average heart rate. So I do notice like, for instance, uh, if I eat something bad or if I like just react negatively to it or if I eat too close to bedtime, then I'll see like a slightly uh, higher uh, resting heart rate and also like some uh, interruptions in uh, HRV and so and like maybe deep sleep quality. So those will be something the immediate things everyone can see that, okay, my sleep yep. quality sucks and they can trace back to it. Usually like nutrition uh, or like blue light or something, those things they interrupt with it. But also like, like yeah, just general 
let's say, co cognition and uh, focus, those things can also be affected, especially like uh, if, you're, if you're like somewhat metabolically inflexible, then you may experience these uh, dips more often or you may react negatively uh, to bad food more because your body is kind of struggling to deal with it. But uh, if, if, if you're really, let's say, keto adapted a lot, then you probably shouldn't uh, notice like a whole lot of difference or like depend, depends on like how much <laughs> your uh, bad food are you getting. And uh, like definitely it's, it's a matter of, again, uh, the, the uh, hormetic dose and uh, how, how much poison are you getting exposed to. Yeah, your, your resilience gets much higher and, mm -hmm. and mine's higher than it's ever been. Uh, I do know uh, from my aura score, I woke up like five times last night. I don't remember it. And that never happens. I get really high sleep scores and, uh, and I got a lot of deep sleep, but less REM than normal. Anyway, I'm just noticing my, my brain's off a little bit and I'm going, like, there's, there's always a reason. Uh, and it could just be a shortage of smart drugs, but, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll figure that well, out. Well, you can't win every day. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And the good news is, and uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to continue my uh, keto bro question because I remember what I was saying for that. <laughs> <laughs> so these keto bros will say, I got my keto levels up to five. Now the guy's like, I pounded this stuff that tasted like gasoline mm. and now I got my ketones up to seven. And I kind of look at them and then I, I imagine uh, the adults from the decade that I was born in, which uh, to you would be ancient history. I was born in the seventies. <laughs> so in the seventies, there were these guys going, you know, carbs give you energy. And then there's these two guys going, you know what? I got my blood glucose up to 400 after I pounded all these, you know, sugary drinks. And the other guys, yeah, I got mine up to 450. And it, it seems like in either case, if you're getting the energy, the energy molecule in your blood that high, it's because you're not using it mm. and it's probably not yeah. beneficial. Yeah. Do you see any benefits to having exceptionally high ketones in the body? Like, is their presence doing something magic that you've come across in, in your research uh, that I haven't? Probably uh, some of the research by Dominic D'Agostino is showing that elevation of uh, these ketones in your bloodstream with the help of exogenous ketones and ketone esters has like neuroprotective effects and and used for epilepsy, et cetera. Yeah. But I think they're not like, uh, the the results aren't based upon like super high levels of these ketones. They're somewhat in the therapeutic uh, range. And I, I, I would also suggest, like you said, that if you have a lot of these energy molecules in your bloodstream, then yeah, it means that you're not really burning them. And at the same time, any excess, whether that be glucose, whether that be protein, whether that be fat or ketones, any excess isn't something that your body actually wants. Your body wants to maintain this very tight range of energy and uh, higher, even like a higher metabolic rate isn't beneficial for longevity because it's going to essentially wear down your mitochondria and uh, high levels of energy in the bloodstream may also just you know, indicate that first of all, you're not using it. And secondly, it's going to start to, I don't know, ravage or damage some of the healthy cells into doing. Uh, that is a, a well thought out, uh, rational perspective on it. Uh, I would, uh, I've, I definitely interviewed Dominic. I think he was around episode 80 mm. of the 600 and something. So several years ago, and I think one other time since then, um, what I haven't seen in his research, but I haven't asked him personally is whether you know, someone with cancer is doing hyperbaric therapy, whether having a level of four versus three on their ketones mm. has any statistical difference or whether it's just having enough ketones that they're abundantly available. Right. Uh, and I, I don't know. Uh, I, what do you know about uh, things like candida or, or even cancer using ketones as a fuel source? Well, uh, I do have heard that it's useful for uh, treating cancer and uh, even uh, like fasting plus keto is uh, like and hyperbaric and that can be somewhat an uh, effective strategy. But I've also seen like some uh, conflicting research in some instance, especially from uh, like autophagy research that some form of autophagy isn't always good when you are having this sort of malignancy and even like bacteria, right. even some bacterial infections aren't ideal to treat with uh, fasting and autophagy. So yeah, I think it's, it's supposed to be like a very context dependent thing and uh, very depend upon this particular type of cancer and disease. So uh, probably some intermittency is, again, some of the critical aspects and uh, combining different strategies yeah. and not relying solely on one thing solely because you, you read online that fasting cures cancer and, and uh, ketones <laughs> too, so, et cetera. So you have to be very kind of diligent about it and actually work yeah. with uh, someone who is uh, you know, doing it professionally. 
that is uh, that that is a, a wonderful thing uh, to remind listeners of. Uh, I have a, a friend who said, "Oh, you know, I have breast cancer," and <laughs> so she went and did an alternative treatment that didn't work. But she was sort of so scared to know whether it worked or not that she didn't uh, she didn't go back to get a scan to see if it worked or not. Mm-hmm. It, it was one of those sort of ostrich moves mm-hmm. where you put your head in the sand <laughs> and. Of course, the thing didn't work, although it could have, and uh, so it resulted in a much bigger procedure. Unfortunately, she made it. Uh, but what that all means is the type of cancer you have, some of them can survive on ketones, yeah. and people say, I'm going to starve my yeast infection. Newsflash, candida albicans, which causes the majority, but not all yeast infections, there's other species of candida that are that are a problem. Uh, but candida albicans can and does eat ketones mm. as a fuel source as well as glucose. So the idea that you're going to just starve it, it, it actually doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. And I'm intrigued because I, I meet the classical definition of someone who definitely had multiple metabolic problems and you call it chronic illness. Because when I was uh, young, you know, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, and toxic mold poisoning was probably the root cause of some of those. And you know, pre-diabetes and high, uh, high blood sugar and high stroke and heart attack risk and all kinds of bad stuff, right? You take someone with that, that set of just, just unfortunate situations like that, and then you say, oh, go hack yourself. Well, okay, I did that. Fortunately, uh, I was in a position where I'd made some money that I lost later, but I ended up spending hundreds of thousands of dollars hacking myself, and I became a pretty substantial expert in it because there were no experts to tell me, oh, by the way, Dave, you can't starve the candida, because of course I had candida as a part of all that. When you live in a moldy house, you get yeast infections inside your gut, right? But today, (laughs) I mean, your book's out there. Uh, There's abundant knowledge out there, and there are functional medicine doctors who can sit down and they can actually measure the yeast that you have and say, oh, this yeast is susceptible to, and they can tell you the compounds. Yeah. And one compound may be caprylic acid, which is awesome. And sometimes it's not caprylic acid. By the way, there's another name for caprylic acid. If it's triple distilled, made from coconuts and filtered by clay in the United States uh, to extreme measures, the name for caprylic acid would be brain octane. It's C8-MCT is what caprylic acid is. Uh, and, uh, it, it's one of those things you, you could say, Oh, it does. It doesn't, it's, it either, if you have the stuff in your gut, that's susceptible, it is, but it's all measurable now. And it wasn't before. So you are, if you're, if you're fat or you're tired or you're feeling hopeless, you're living in a time of just shocking abundance of knowledge, information, and tools to fix all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you can use Dr. Google, and then you go into a real doctor, and the real doctor can help you with some tests and help to guide things like that, Uh, just like Seem is saying here, uh, in in that you you can get some good advice. And if you're dealing with something as big as cancer, uh, you better get that good advice, Mm -hmm. Uh, but you might want to get multiple uh, multiple viewpoints, and you might want to try more than one treatment, uh, because that's okay. Yeah. Yes. All right, I'll get off my soapbox there. I'm supposed to be interviewing you, but I get passionate about this. You, you pushed a button for me, Sam. Yeah, it's uh, like, <laughs> I think you have to kind of remember that your body is always adapting to what you throw at it, so to say. So imagine if uh, like there is this uh, trench warfare between your healthy cells and bad cells, and uh, if you con- consistently throw mortar shells on your enemy, which is like the cancer cells, eventually those mm-hmm. cancer cells, they're going to dig in and they're going to build bunkers, they're going to build castles, and that same mortar shell is going to have less of an effect. So uh, that's why even the, ba- you know, the bad cells are also adapting to the treatments that you're throwing at. And that's why it's important to do them like short term and uh, also look at it where you're throwing your mortar shells and what's the effect and then changing your approach so that you could actually like break them down. Teaching the world to be cyclical and its approach to maintaining uh, our own hardware is a, is a great act of service. So uh, I'm, I'm happy that you're, you're carrying that through almost everything you talk about because man, I did not understand that for, for many years. And uh, you can be harmed by eating sugar all the time or never eating any carbs all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, I think we both fundamentally agree on that. And speaking of harming uh, yourself, uh, this is uh, one of my favorite questions uh, people ask me about because you're also a biohacker for a while. What 
is the worst outcome from a biohack you've ever experienced? When you say, I'm going to try this on mm. myself, <laughs> what backfired the worst? Um, well, I haven't had like any huge um, failures in my experiments, so to say. Like I've, when before I started keto, then I already listened to your podcast and gained some good tips on how do you start it and how to avoid like MCT uh, <laughs> explosions initially starting. Oh yeah, that disaster pants <laughs> yeah. wasn't a part of your so, life. So, lucky you. <laughs> so luckily, I was fortunate in that sense. But uh, I would say that maybe just general, uh, like you know, when you are doing these biohacks and you lis listen to things about fasting ketosis and hit cardio and cold cold therapy and ice baths etc then you kind of want to put them all together and combine so i think i may i haven't had any like serious uh, you know negative effects from it but just general maybe like a somewhat uh, you know hypothyroidism a little bit for short periods feeling somewhat cold when you're fasting for too long uh, or yeah. just like you know feeling not that energized because you're putting all those uh, stressors onto your body and you're not giving you enough time to recover so yeah, I've definitely learned that that's why not going too enthusiastically <laughs> into those things and not uh, trying to maximize everything else you do and actually giving your body a break and heal, allow it to recover. That that's where like most of the magic wow. actually happens. So yeah, like e even now uh, I heard it from Dr. Dr. Mercola, but he heard it from uh, uh, Walter Longo and he said that the miracle of fasting happens in the refeeding. So that's essentially kind of describes yeah. the entire uh, process of hormesis and general uh, stress adaptation. Uh, that is uh, uh, that that's beautiful. It, it's making it about recovery. Uh, your point there is, is very nuanced as well, though. Saying if you wanted to stack up all these things, you're probably gonna have more problems. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the the big efforts that I'm working on right now is at Upgrade Labs. So Upgrade Labs is the, the experiential biohacking spin out of Bulletproof. So this is our, our answer to sort of the big exercise industry where we all basically chase tigers and lift rocks uh, or, <laughs> or variations on those things. And I'm just thinking there's gotta be a better way. But how do you know if you're gonna walk into Upgrade Labs should you do the intense red and infrared light therapy first, then cryotherapy, and then do the thing that makes you triple your muscle growth versus lifting rocks? Uh, or should you do this unusually timed cardio with cold compression on it, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's all sorts of paths through the technology. So we're building artificial intelligence and machine learning to look at your current state, how much recovery, mm -hmm. how much stimulation. So no one knows. We have trainers who know. We have theories and we have best practices and and things like that. But I want to validate and test and iterate the best practices. And maybe some of that knowledge will come out. And in another couple of years, the biohacks you just mentioned, Seem, uh, will be able to say, you know, if you were going to do an intermittent fast, it'd be amazing what happened if you, if you jumped in a sauna ahead mm -hmm. of time because this combination of heat shock protein is going to be great. Mm -hmm. And if you did some really weird breathing exercises to create hypoxia, uh, that would also be good because you need a, an elevation of HIF-1 factor. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows mm -hmm. because we're testing single variables now and, and we actually live in a multivariable world. So I guess what you're saying is if you mix your variables. Yeah. Uh, you might get, especially all going the same direction, you might get negative results. Yeah, for sure. Like uh, like you said, um, everyone has their own kind of requirements and uh, everyone needs different approaches. And uh, like probably someone uh, who is metabolically unhealthy needs a different type of fasting routine than someone who is very healthy and uh, already in ketosis, so to say, at least keto adapted. So yeah, th th there's different ways of doing fasting. There are different ways of taking uh, tropics there are just different ways of doing hit cardio and it all depends on the particular individual and i like it that you said that we're going to develop these artificial intelligence to actually tell you what kind of like what even like on the nutritional level like what kind of food actually fits your genetics and uh, like what's your microbiome status etc so yeah <laughs> exciting times uh, that are coming out and we can kind of individualize and personalize all these different uh, strategies i love it that you just uh, mentioned that uh we both use the aura ring mm. Uh, and Harpreet's been on the show uh, to talk about it. And I, I think this is the best piece of tracking tech uh, that I, I'm aware of. And I was CTO of uh, a wristband tracking company <laughs> earlier, it, it, not that many years ago. Now, uh, so that's one. Uh, in terms of gut bacteria, I use the Viome test. I've, I've been involved with the company since the very early days. Do you use Viome or do you use anything else to look at what's going on in your gut? Uh, no, like uh, the Viome they don't ship to Europe yet, so uh, I'm, I'm waiting until they do. So uh, I'm a bit behind that 
Uh, but I do take like a- well. Next time you're in the U.S., to have yeah, it sent to your hotel. For sure. they, and your your information will go to Europe. So it's, uh, I usually do mine in a hotel in the U.S. because it's faster. But uh, yeah, for okay. sure, I'll have to do that. And uh, but yeah, I do like general blood tests and just the, like uh, organic acid tests every once in a while to uh, pay attention. But organic acid, okay. I, I love organic acid tests uh, for mitochondrial function. What about uh, either inflammatory cytokines or food allergy panels? Because one of the things keto people can get is food allergies if they're if the lining of their gut doesn't have enough mucin. Have you tested? Uh, yeah, I have, uh, but uh, I haven't had any like problems. I've seen that I'm qu- my, my kind of body is very able to handle even like gluten and uh, those, so on, so I don't have any allergies to dairy or, or something like that. So, so you come from good stock and you live in a part of the world where until last year, Roundup was banned. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Give yourself another 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> <Let's> <laughs> <hope>. <laughs> Although it's looking like... Uh, looking like Bayer might not be like in life because they keep losing lawsuits over mm-hmm. all the bad they've done to the, the bacteria ecosystem of our planet with their stuff. So sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> maybe everyone in Europe won't get food allergies the way they did here. Mm. All right. Uh, is there anything else about autophagy that you wish the world knew that they just don't get? Like, like what's, what's missing? There are many other ways of also activating autophagy besides caloric restriction and fasting. A few of those we've already mentioned, like uh, saunas, high intensity cardio, uh, heat and cold exposure. They also are another uh, like other ways of stimulating those same longevity pathways without having to essentially starve yourself. And uh, yeah, you can gain a lot of these beneficial effects for lifespan as well as metabolic health and metabolic flexibility by implementing these things. So maybe like one of the best uh, strategies everyone should do, regardless of whether the biohacking or not, is like resistance training, building muscle, uh, even like taking regular saunas and uh, some form of like uh, cold exposure as, as well. So like those are like part and parcel of every biohacker already. But I think the emphasis shouldn't be to kick your kick your ass all the time and uh, do a lot of stress stressful activities, but also like actually allow your body to heal and use the, use those things as a form of a recovery. Uh, see, at 24 years old, you just displayed a, an amount of wisdom that I probably didn't really get until I was 40 around that, hey, it's okay to be kind to your biology instead of just pushing all the time. So I'm damned impressed. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that, that, that is awesome. Well, I've had like good uh, influences in the sense that if you are, you know, like you said earlier, that we have access to technology and information, so you can learn yeah. about all those things already and you don't have to make the same mistakes uh, other people have made. So I'm actually supposed to be not making those same mistakes <laughs> because otherwise oh, we'll be like uh, going downward as a species. <laughs> uh, very, uh, very cool perspective. Uh, perhaps I was just too egotistical uh, to learn from my, uh, from my elders. And that's one of the reasons that now I, I cultivate friendships with people in their 70s and 80s and 90s because they know more stuff than I do. It's kind of amazing. It's almost mm-hmm. like they've lived another 50 years than I have. <laughs> so, exactly. Uh, that's, that's, that's really cool. Uh, well, kudos uh, for the, the amount of learning and your unique ability to synthesize knowledge. Uh, what do you do for blue light blocking? Do you have true light, true light, or sorry, true dark glasses? If not, I'll send you some. But uh, do you just use dimmer switches? Do you put stickers over the LED lights? Like, what's your what's your basic strategy there? Yeah, I do have a true dark, like the twilight. Oh, you do? Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. I'll send you some anyway. If you want, but. <laughs> the uh, twilight and the day walkers as well. So, I, I've, I when I first got them, then I noticed like a huge improvement in my deep sleep, and actually. Uh, yeah, a guest posted an article on uh, True Dark's uh, uh, website as well, uh, where I talked about. Oh, thank you! I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was just released a few days ago. But yeah, like I, I saw like an improvement in like fifteen uh, percent of deep sleep uh, just by using fifty or fifteen. Fifteen. F- fifteen. Okay. Yeah. So I saw like just just because of blocking out the blue light, it it, it did like show a higher score on my wiring. So that's yeah. that's a huge huge thing. And uh, other other uh, blue blocking uh, mechanisms or things I use is just uh, like filters on the smartphone, such as like on on my Android it's uh, Twilight, and on my PC it's uh, Flux. Mm-hmm. So those are the easiest ones. And also just not having uh, bright lights around the household uh, in the evening. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty much because I, I've seen some research showing that. Uh, the blue light can also interrupt with melatonin through the skin. So there are some receptors in the skin as well. So you don't want to be 
bathing in uh, <laughs> bright lights uh, when you're about to go to bed. You know what's uh, what's really cool? I, I've been uh, maybe one of the loudest voices saying that, uh, look, we have receptors in our skin. This is an issue. Uh, however, when I talked with Sachin Panda about that, he said, Dave, yeah, I saw the same study. Uh, and uh, Sachin Panda is a researcher from the Salk Institute mm. uh, who's just wrote a really good book on time-restricted eating mm. uh, and just a fascinating, passionate guy. And he said, Dave, that study looked pretty good, but then I really went in on it. And what they had done is they had, they had taken a bright, uh, bright uh, white light behind the knee, all taped up, or no light at all. And, and the people couldn't tell. Like, there's no way to know whether you were getting a light or not. And then they said, oh, look, when, when they have this light, the sleep quality is no good, but there was a TV on in the room. Mm. <laughs> wow. so, there, and, and it was the, but there was a TV oh. on that they didn't control for, oh. uh, and that that was almost certainly a major confounding factor. And mm. then subsequent studies had found that that there, there are photoreceptors in the skin, but you're unlikely to affect the, the circadian clock and the SCN or mm. the core clock in the system. Uh, but you might have some more aging, like photo aging of the skin or something mm. if you're sleeping with lots of blue light. I still would say you should sleep in a perfectly dark room. Exactly. Uh, but I'm less concerned about there being a little bit of light on my skin than I used to be based on all that stuff. Uh, but I still think, why would you not dim your light at night? It's pretty clear. Yeah, exactly. Like, why wouldn't you take advantage of it or not? Why not be cautious <laughs> in a sense? And, you know, you don't have to be definitely like neurotic about it and be scared of some blue light on your skin. You just have to kind of know that it's probably not as detrimental as uh, blue light through the eyes but at the same time if you're already home then just you know dimming down the lights it also like psychologically calms your mind and uh, makes you prepared for uh, yeah. the sleep so to say so even the psychological effect uh, can be you know significant beautiful final question for you seem how long are you gonna live <laughs> yeah that's an interesting question like when i did a podcast with uh, dr mercola a few days ago i was all he asked me the same question because uh, he know. Oh, is he asking that question now too? That's no, cool. no. He 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 asked me because he knew you were going to ask it. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> so uh, I I I've, I'm going to give you the same answer that I gave to him, uh, which is like I'm I'm not that worried about like living as long as possible. I'm like more focused mm -hmm. on um, making sure that the information and the influence I have on the world would live longer than me or live longer as my physical body, so to say because uh, that's going to have like a much more, let's say, significant impact on actually changing the world than me living longer. So I'm not, I'm not worried about uh, actually actual immortality. I, I would be much more concerned with like legacy and uh, being remembered for something that uh, actually changed the world. Very, uh, uh, very cool, a very, very nuanced answer. Don't you feel like though, if your physical tissues lived uh, live longer that you'd have the ability to have a bigger impact on the world <laughs> for sure like that's that, that's what's motivating me <laughs> that's exactly that, yeah that's another <laughs> point and a nuance that you know um yeah with with the advancement of technology and uh other biohacks we will probably increase the average lifespan of many many people uh, and but at the same time it's it's not inherently dependent on, on me like I'm, I'm i'm not the one who is going to create those technologies i'm the one who is going to have to yeah. maybe test them out or something but it's not like solely depend upon me. So I'm not focusing on that. But uh, yeah, I would, I would suggest that if you were to be living like several hundred years for 500 years, et cetera, then the impact on the world will be different uh, or like more, yeah. more uh, on a grander, great grander uh, scale. But at the same time, you have to be also mindful of the fact that if you are living very old, then um, it's also going to impose many different kinds of problems on society and culture that we don't really comprehend at the moment because we don't have those yeah. <laughs> challenges. So yeah, it's, it's a funny, fun, fun time to be a part of this sort of a change in uh, human uh, biology. It, it is. And uh, one of the reasons I'm, I'm asking you this question specifically is since you started university, you've been biohacking. You know more about anti-aging now than anyone at any age did 20 years ago. And you practice anti-aging as a young, healthy human. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I know where I am right now. Uh, and if I could come back from the crappy start that I had, 
and I'm thinking, man, what would happen if I did all these practices when I came out with a good start and I started you know, in my late teens? Mm-hmm. Uh, the outcome, the, like the way you look when you're 70, even if you don't apply any of the stem cells and advanced anti-aging technology and all that stuff, is going to be shocking mm. uh, to your peers who eat, you know, a crappy diet right. and, and all that sort of stuff. Completely shocking. But I, I want to know what's 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 going to happen, what's going to look like. So the only way that I can think of to know what you're going to look like when you're a hundred is for me to be around when I'm whatever, 140, <laughs> yeah. whatever I'm going to be, to be like, wow, you look a lot better than I do. That's great. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I uh, I would encourage you to live a long time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's gonna put uh, put more pressure on myself to actually uh, hold up to it or live up to it. There you go. Well, your website is seamland s i i m land dot com. You've got a bunch of cool stuff up there. Your podcast, uh, Body Mind Empowerment, right, yeah. uh, is doing uh, very well. You've got more than 100 episodes out there, uh, and kudos for that. By the way, most people give up after 20 episodes <laughs> when they realize it's actually work to do a podcast, so mm-hmm. you made it way past that barrier. And uh, thanks for being on Bulletproof Radio. Well, thanks for having me, and uh, I'm glad to talk with you. If you liked today's episode, you know what to do. Pick up a copy of Metabolic Autophagy, if that's the kind of light reading that makes you happy. And if you do decide to do that, Uh, You owe it to yourself to go to Amazon and leave a review for the book. And here's why you owe it to yourself. Because when you review a book, you're expressing gratitude. And when you express gratitude, it extends your telomeres by 47%. Okay, I made up that last fact. Uh, But the bottom line is expressing gratitude actually does feel good. And it really helps us authors know that what we're doing is worth the time and energy it takes to write a book. So thanks for deciding to review whatever it is you read because we actually do see it. Have a beautiful day.